number one. It's only in that in the latter stages of the editing, when I begin to work on the assembly, that I really begin to think seriously about the themes, because uh, a sequence in isolation may mean one thing, but when it's put in relationship to other sequences, it sometimes, or very often, has a, another meaning, and one sequence will uh, reflect or illuminate or echo uh, another sequence. And it's, the, it's in the creation of that resonance uh, that, the, uh, that the structure emerges. Particularly for a film like Berkeley, but it's true in all the films, there's, um, I'm very concerned with the relationship between the literal and the abstract. Uh, because the literal is, you know, what's going on in the sequence or, the, uh, or any number of sequences, but the abstractions, the abstractions are created because of both of the choice of sequences and their relationship to each other and what is suggested by the relationship. And for me, a film only begins to work, or only does work, if I, can, if I see that parallel track of the literal and the abstract. With the editing, I mean, I, I don't start off with any, uh, I, mean, I don't even start the shooting with any preconceptions. You know, I generally end up using everything that I like. I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, Berkeley is, is a longer film in part because it's a very complex place. Uh, 35,000 students, roughly 5,000 faculty, 4,000 other people who work there, uh, administration. Um, you can't ever get it all, but there's so much to choose from. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to be sure not that it was representative, because I, didn't, I don't know how to do that, but at least it was a fair account of what I observed and experienced while I was there. I always, I mean, I like to think, unless it's pretentious for me to say so, that my movies are more novelistic than journalistic, and I, I think that's always been true. I'm having a look at institutions, but dissect, no. I'm interested in human behavior, uh, I'm interested in human behavior, and I, I have to find a framework in which that can be explored. I work very hard, for example, the meeting where uh, they're discussing you know, their overall strategy when to call in the police, well, that meeting probably took an hour and three quarters. You know, it's about eight minutes in the film, or maybe nine minutes. Uh, and so it's an illustration of the need to compress uh, uh, and synthesize, and at the same time edit it in such a way that it appears as if it took place the way you're seeing it, even though it didn't. Well, I've forgotten, there are seven or eight teaching scenes in the movie, uh, but there are 3,500 courses offered at Berkeley. Uh, so, uh, that's, uh, so of the ones that I sh shot, uh, I used, uh, I didn't use them all, and uh, of the ones that I used, I, I picked those portions that uh, illustrated the themes that I began to extract from the experience. It's all thematically connected. I mean, one of the ways I know that a film is finished is if I, in this, you know, basically editing is talking to yourself, and I have to, no matter how I've arrived at the cut, even though I may have arrived at a cut because I dreamt it or thought of it in the shower, I have to be able to rationalize it. And, and one of the last things I do in this internal conversation called editing is explain to myself why each shot is in the film what its relation is to the shot before and after it, and how the first 10 minutes, for example, is connected to the last 10 minutes. Uh, and I, I have to be able to do that exercise in a way that's not self-deluding, or at least I hope it's not self-deluding, in order to feel that the film is finished. Uh, for the editing, uh, I, I start off the editing by looking at all the rushes. 
And then I uh, immediately put aside maybe about half of them. Uh, so then I, I'm working with 50% of the material. And then I edit all the sequences I think I might use. And then when I've got all the candidate sequences uh, in close to final form, which is after nine or 10 months of editing, even in this case if the editing had been interrupted, I then over three or four days do the first assembly of the movie. And that usually comes out to, you know, 45 minutes to an hour longer than the final film. And then I work on the rhythm, internal rhythm within the sequence and the, and the rhythm between the sequences. And at that point I can make changes very quickly because everything's in close to final form. And then that, you know, five or six weeks later I have, have the final film. I never make a film to a predetermined length because I don't know how to do that. I think I have an obligation to not only the people who gave me permission but to the people who are in the film to make the film a fair report on what I think I've learned as a consequence in this case of being at Berkeley for three months. Uh, and so I, I don't uh, think about, you know, I don't have any need and I'm under no pressure to make a short of the film. PBS is in America has always been extremely generous with me and they have always taken the film and shown it in prime time the way I've made it. I mean, my contract gives me complete editorial control. I, I insisted on it from the beginning, so I established the precedent very early on and I never deviated from it because otherwise it's somebody else's film. But the days were long, or, uh, you know, I have a knack of picking subjects for the films that are open 24 hours a day. Uh, and so they're, you know, long 12, 14 hour days at least. Uh, no, I mean, it's, in order to make these kind of movies, you have to stay in shape. It's a sport, you know, because you, you can't, you know, you can't allow yourself to get tired. And if you get tired, you make mistakes. And, I mean, not that you don't get tired, but in order to persevere for a long period of time, you have to be in shape. I don't talk, I mean, I, I don't like to talk about a movie when it's in progress, and I don't talk about it much afterward either. Uh, uh, it, I find it disconcerting. I mean, everybody has their own style. I don't say that's the right way to do it. But I'm afraid, I, I believe in the old cliche that you can talk a movie away uh, and your ideas can dissipate it. So I, I keep it very self-contained. Uh, well, I mean, other people show their work and talk about it, but I, I don't know, I, I have a feeling if I, if I showed it to anybody and talked about it, I would feel the other person was always right. Uh, and this way I, <laughs> I, I don't have to, uh, raise yet another situation where self-doubt exists. Everybody thinks it's easy for me to get money because I've made a lot of movies, but it isn't. I mean, I have to sing for my supper the way everybody else does. And it's the least attractive part of making movies, but it's absolutely necessary. I mean, I know, because I've been doing it for a long time, I know who all the key players are, and, you know, there have been an over, I mean, I've been making movies now since 1967, so the number of, the, 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 the key players have changed, uh, uh, and uh, several times. Uh, but, I mean, uh, public television, public television has always been extremely helpful to me. On the other hand, I don't, I, I've never gotten more than maybe 20, 25% of the budget from public television. So uh, I, I have to seek money from foundations, and in some cases, uh, the films I've done in France, I've been able to get money in France from the French government, government subsidy. Well, I just explain it. I mean, I, I basically say my proposal is usually a page and a half, and it, it says, I describe the technique, one paragraph. 
then I talk about the subject matter, but in general terms. Uh, for example, uh, if I'm going to do a movie about a hospital, I say, well, or an emergency ward at a hospital, I say, you're going to hang about the emergency ward. Uh, and I, then, I, then I say, the following event, I don't know that I'm going to get the following events. These are hypothetical situations that may arise while I'm there, which I'm using uh, as illustrations of the kinds of sequences that I may get. And then I, I, I just imagine, based on, in some cases, on a little knowledge, uh, the kinds of events that might occur. And I make it clear that there's no guarantee that I'm going to get them. And I, and I, I just put down a laundry list. Uh, and then I say at the end that, you know, uh, I, I expect that I'll accumulate, you know, 100, 150 hours or whatever it is of rushes, and then I figure out the film and the editing. I mean, it's a very short, straightforward, honest statement. I, because I, I, uh, I never, well, I, I don't have a thesis. And it's, uh, in Europe, uh, and I don't know whether it's true in America now, too, because I, I don't have that experience of, of knowing, I mean, in Europe, uh, for French television, for example, people have to write these very long, detailed proposals, which are essentially bullshit, uh, because they don't know what they're going to find. Or if they follow the proposal, they're going to be blind to things that are occurring that would be good for the film, but are not uh, in the proposal. And I think often proposals are written for the protection of commissioning editors uh, so that there's a paper trail so that if the film doesn't turn out or somebody in the cultural bureaucracy objects to the final film, the commissioning editor can say, well, he told me or she told me there was going to be this and they did that and, you know, here's what they said and I wasn't, you know, I couldn't be on the set every day. So it's a form of protection of the commissioning editor which uh, I so far have successfully avoided. I mean, I, I worked at avoiding it, too. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not chance. I mean, I've been able to succeed at it, but I, I, I took a very hard line at the beginning about it, and I continue to do that. Well, I, don't, I mean, I don't show the film to anybody till it's done. So, and, and I always insist on the contract saying that I have complete editorial control. You know, other than, you know, the FCC regulations about obscenity and all that. But, uh, uh, I mean, this crazy horse was not on public television. Public television wouldn't get funded for 300 years if they showed crazy horse. <laughs>
and it's it, you know I mean it, it may be pretentious but there, there's something artisanal about editing film because you have the film in your hand and you make the cuts and you feel at least I you know you feel closer to the material which, which may be bullshit but it's the way and I, I feel I know a lot of people feel I mean it was strange I, I when I was editing the last letter which is already 11 years ago uh, and that was shot in 35, and I was editing, it was in Paris, and I was editing one Saturday afternoon, and somebody, it was a trans, somewhat transparent door, and somebody knocked on the door and said, you know, can I come in? What are you doing? What's that? And he, I thought he was kidding me. He'd never seen film. And this was 11 years ago. There's a lot of mythology that digital editing gives you more choice. But the choice has nothing to do with the machine. The choice has to do with what exists in your head and, and your response to the material. Uh, and I don't find editing digitally any faster. Certainly no more choices. Uh, and uh, in fact, there was, there was something useful about having to go to the wall, take down a roll of film, thread it up, and roll down to the section you were looking for. Because when you were rolling down to the, the sequence you were looking for, you were also reviewing something. And you're also, you're thinking. And, and I mean, I find with, with, with the avid that I have to sort of say, calm down a little bit, you know. There's no rush, it's, you know, because it, it, the, the crucial thing is to have an idea and to know where to make the choice, not that you can make it faster. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think I make movies, uh, and I, I sort of resist classifications. And you know, cinema verite is uh, it's just a pompous French term, uh, one of many. Uh, but uh, and I think what happened was that people figured out there were some technological innovations that made it possible to shoot with available light with a camera and a tape recorder that weren't connected. And that opened up the world. I mean, opened up anything was a possible subject where there was available light. Uh, and that's, that's the innovation. Uh, it, it's completely useless, uh, uh, or in my point of view, completely meaningless to cinema verite, direct cinema, observational cinema, fly in the wall. Fly in the wall is the most demeaning because this, no, none of the flies I know are conscious. But I, I think it's the, it, it's the people that figured out the technological changes that made it possible that op opened up the possibility of making movies on any subject. Well, I tell them one thing, marry somebody rich. <laughs>